Okay, so good morning everybody. Welcome to our Engineered Systems Research Seminar. First I'd like to acknowledge that we're on Ghana land and that we recognise that Flinders University operates on Indigenous people's traditional lands and waters and acknowledge their continued responsibility to care for country at the university's various teaching locations, including the lands and waters of the following people. So we're referring to the Ghana people here at the Bedford Park and Tomsey campuses. And so I'd like to officially introduce uh, Associate Professor Russell Brinkworth as our keynote speaker for today, uh, who is uh, working in the area of autonomous systems I will uh, do an introduction coming up after this. So his, his title was What Insects Can Teach Us About the Evolution of Robotics. So a little bit about uh, Russell. Uh, Russell is Associate Professor here at Flinders and joined us in 2019. He uh, obtained his bachelor's degree in both science and biomedical engineering at Flinders University in 2000. In 2004, he obtained his PhD in neuroscience at the Department of Physiology at the University of Adelaide and went on to continue as a postdoctoral researcher in the same department uh, in the Insect Vision Laboratory, where I presume Russell already had done his PhD with the same group, perhaps, or no? OK, it's fine. In 2006, Russell was awarded an ARC Research uh, Fellowship, uh, Industry Research Fellowship, uh, at the same group at the University of Adelaide, which is great. And in 2008, he obtained his Graduate Certificate in Education. In 2010, Russell joined the Uni of Adelaide uh, School of Mechanical Engineering as a lecturer, and in 2011 uh, joined the uh, University of South Australia as a senior lecturer and program director for the Masters of Autonomous Systems. In 2012, Russell was recognised as Young South Australian Scientist of the Year, and in 2014 he became a program director, I've got that twice, my bad, a little typo there, at the School of Engineering. UniSA. So Russell's research interests uh, are in applying self-adaptive biologically inspired signal processing for use in robotics and surveillance. So a very interesting field of research and uh, Russell's presentation title for today is What Insects Can Teach Us About the Evolution of Robotics. So please join me in warmly welcoming Russell. Thank you Russell. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the future and about what we can do with robotics. Um, and I'm not going to talk about some dystopian future that we might see from a lot of sci-fi writers, but something, if not a little bit uh, nicer, something a little bit more helpful to humans. So I want to talk about the evolution of robotics, where we are with manufacturing robotics and where we want to go to the pinnacle of robotics in the future, which is, of course, Bender. So what is the missing link that we have here between the rigid robots that build things under strict circumstances and people that can come up with quips on the, on the fly and interact in a realistic manner? Um, and the metaphor for this is the sandwich problem. What it is, is there are, there are things that humans are really, really good at and there are things that robots are really, really good at. And the things that humans and animals in general are really good at is adapting to situations, changing things on the fly, being able to accommodate flexibility and variability. And that's something that modern robotics has a big problem with. So most people in this room and watching online, will be able to make themselves a sandwich. Go grab some bread, maybe some lettuce or salads of some sort, meat possibly or not, whatever it is, and put together a sandwich. But that's a really difficult problem for a robot because it's unconstrained. And the, the ingredients are a bit flexible, a bit variable. The bread's a bit floppy, can move around. Um, in order to get a robot to do it, you have to put it under rigid circumstances and constrain it. And that's a problem. We want unconstrained, we want to interact, we want flexibility and variability. So where do we get that? Well, our eyes, for example, can do this much better than a camera. So who here has taken a photo of somebody standing in front of a bright light? So we have 
most people have used a camera before. Right, so what happens? What happens if you take a photo of somebody standing in front of a bright light? Silhouette. Silhouette. Because the dynamic range of the scene exceeds what's possible within the sensor of the camera and the camera can take a global view of the scene and it adapts to make sure that on average the scene is nicely illuminated. But what happens if part of the scene is bright and part of the scene is dark? Or the same thing, what happens if you put one foot in hot water and one foot in cold water? On average you're okay, but each individual part is not ideal. And that's the same thing that happens with your camera. You can have overexposed and underexposed sections where you lose information, but on average you've got an averagely illuminated scene. So what do you have to do? How do you adjust to this? Well, a way of explaining how your eye does this is to look at what we might call visual illusions. So here we have two squares. We have square A and square B. And it's quite clear to anybody that looks at this that square A is a lot darker than square B. But what if I put a bar down the middle that is the same colour, same brightness? I show that both A and B are the same as that line. Therefore, A and B must be the same. But they look completely different when they're separate. But they are actually the same. And that's because your eyes improve and convey local contrast. The variability locally is what's important because it gives you the detail, it gives you the texture, it helps set things up. It's the same way that I look short when standing next to any normal person, but if I went to a childcare centre, I would look huge. It's what happens in what's important is what's relative to what's around you. Things look bright or dark not because they're bright or dark, but because they're bright or dark compared to what's around them. So if you get a sheet of paper with white paper with black text on it in one hand and the same white paper with black text in the other hand and you stand where there's a sh sharp shadow, you hold the pa one page in the shadow and one page under direct sunlight, there are more photons coming off of the black text in sunlight than there is off the white page in the shadow. Yet you still see them as black and white because it's what's locally is important. But you take a photo of that with your camera and you'll be able to tell that one is overexposed and one is underexposed. So how do eyes actually work? The traditional camera can either see the dark parts of the scene by having a long exposure but then you overexpose and you can saturate the bright parts or you can see the bright parts of the scene but then you underexpose the dark parts. But what happens in your eye is you get independent adjustment of brightness and gain and all these different factors within each pixel, which is photoreceptor, each cell within the image that you're seeing. And so that way you can adapt dynamically, locally, not as on a global sense, and get a lot more information from the scene without over or underexposing different parts. And then you've got a bandwidth problem. You've got to transmit all that information from your eye to the back of your brain where you start doing your visual processing through the optic nerve. Same thing when you want to download things from the internet. You've got a bandwidth problem. You've got to uh, make sure you've got a large amount of information or more likely you compress the data before you send it. So that's what actually happens. You do a spatial temporal compression within the information of your eye and you transmit the compressed data down the optic nerve. So what actually happens is you don't see things that are uniform. You only see the edges of objects. You can't see what's in the middle. That information does not exist because it's redundant and it's transmitted down your optic nerve and then reconstructed within your brain. And you know this because if you're given 10 seconds to draw a person or you're really bad at drawing like I am, what would you draw? Sticks, circle, you need to build a house, draw a house. Rectangle, rectangle, couple of squares and triangle on top. Like it's just the edges, that gives you all the information you need. 
And you might think we've lost some information by doing this, but in fact we haven't. If we just zoom in on this, which we won't subject you to this for too long, what you can see is you've got more information even though it looks like we've removed it. Even in the dark parts, you can count individual hairs if that's the, on the beard, if that's what you needed to do. You could count bricks on the back if that happened to be the task you wanted to do, but you can't do those things on the regular image because you've lost that information. You've had to make some compromises. So what can flies teach us about this? What are flies really good at doing? Come on, you're like my class. You're supposed to be... Can't spot them. Can't spot them. They avoid you. <laughs> they avoid you. What was that? Really good at flying. They're so good at flying, we call them flies. That, there is no animal we call walks, but we call them flies because they're so good at flying. The other thing they'd probably teach us if they could is that, but we don't listen to them for that. So insect vision is actually really sophisticated on such a minuscule package. It can do all these tasks. Just think about what is actually involved in being able to fly. And these hoverflies, they look kind of like bees, but they're actually hoverflies. Um, that's really good because they can't sting you. And they like pollen, so they're not like blowflies that might like eating unsavoury things. And they're not like bees that'll sting you, so they're a good compromise. Also, they can hover. They're called hoverflies for a reason, right? They hover and they fly. So they're hoverflies. They can hover... And relatively speaking, they hover much more stably than any helicopter pilot can achieve amongst massive winds for their size. And then in the exact same package, they can take off and do barrel rolls and uh, obtain G-forces and perform tricks that are much better than any fighter plane that we have available. Just don't tell defence that JSF is outclassed by a fly. But the... Um, all in the same package. They can hover and they can do all these different manoeuvres, all in the same package. And the power that they require to do this and the size that they require to do this, the brain can fit on your little fingernail. And they can do all these sophisticated tasks and they can chase targets in clutter and, and intercept them. They don't chase them and go behind them. They plot intercept courses and intercept, not just follow. They're very sophisticated in what they're able to do. So how do we reverse engineer a brain? We want to be able to understand how they are able to accomplish these tasks. How do we reverse engineer a brain? How would we do it? Same way you do it for anything else. Put a stimulus in and a probe and reverse engineer it. It's just maybe a little bit harder than what we might be used to, just, just a tiny bit. So in traditional signal processing, uh, what we like to work with, because they're nice and simple and easy, are linear systems, so the output in proportion to the input, proportional change in the input, same proportional change in the output, nice and easy to follow. Uh, time invariant means that if you do, the, do a stimulus at one time period and then do a stimulus at another time period, you get the same result. Um, they're what I'd like to call independent, so the processing function itself isn't dependent on the input. The function doesn't change as a variable according to the input. That, you, that way you can reverse engineer the function reasonably easily. And causal, of course, only depends on past um, inputs because we don't want to break the laws of physics by looking ahead into the future. Biological systems, on the other case, pretty much break every single one of these rules. They're non-linear. They don't even approximate linear functions around an operating point, which is what we like to do for non-linear systems. We'll approximate them as linear around an operating point and then change it. They can't even do that because that disrupts what they're, what they're able to do. They change with time. Um, they're dependent in that the processing function itself actually changes depending on the input, which can be very frustrating. And non-causal, that can be debatable, 
but you get input from, or feedback from the higher centres to predict what's going to happen in the future and anticipate stimuli and react accordingly. That's not really a causal system. But we can still go and try and reverse engineer these flies. So you grab a fly and a needle, very fine electrode. Um, find out where in the fly brain you want to look at. If you want to look at high order processing, you go into the back of the brain. You want to look at early visual processing, you go into the front, which means cu cutting a hole in the eye and sticking a needle directly in the eye. Um, or back of the brain, back of the head, um, if that's what you need to look at for more uh, higher order things. Stick them in front of a stimuli. In this case, the picture is, we've got a nice little computer screen with a moving image. Uh, look down a microscope and pierce a neuron. Now, I just said pierce a neuron. That's easier said than done because the neurons in a fly brain um, are there smaller than you can resolve in a light microscope. So they're essentially invisible. And if you want to pierce them, you've got to have an electrode tip that is smaller than the object you're trying to pierce, otherwise you'll just obliterate it. So therefore, the tip of the electrode is so small it can't be resolved under a light microscope, so it is essentially also invisible. So you are looking down a microscope to hit an invisible target with an invisible spear. That's a little bit tricky. Um, luckily, the, the electrode is tapered, so you can you kind of look to where it heads off into infinity, and then just as it's about to hit the, the, the brain, the outer layer of the brain, you can see the, the change in the fluid surrounding the brain as the tip enter, goes to enter. So you can, predict, you can predict just how far in advance the tip of your spear is. But it gets a bit hit and miss as you go in. Um, and then you have to go in and see if you can find a, a neuron. And then if you can, great. If you can't, go out and try again. Um, there's also a limited number of times you can spike, uh, put, a, put a sphere into a fly brain before it doesn't like it anymore. Um, but that's the process. And then you record what you get. So reverse engineering a neuron. In this case, these some recordings and some illustrations of what you would get from the photoreceptor, the very first neuron in the brain of a fly. So basic inputs, just like you would do for any engineering system. You have a step response and some impulse responses there, just like you would find from any sort of standard analysis of engineering systems. But you can see that they're non-linear. So the step response there, it has a massive change, uh, massive signal to a change, but then it adapts away. This is the equivalent of being inside and being, having your eyes adjusted to the dark and then walking outside and suddenly getting the bright sun. What happens? Overload. Everything looks too bright. You get the signal that this is very bright and then you adapt away. And that's exactly what's happening in this step response. You get this, this very big signal to show you that there's, a, there's light and then it adapts away to a steady state level. Exactly the same as what happens in your eye. And you can see when the light go, gets taken away, things look extra dark, and then they adapt back again to the level that they were at. The rate of adaptation, the function that that performs, how that changes depending on different background levels, these are all dependent and they take a while to untangle. If you have a look at the impulse responses there, we've got the stimulus amplitude is constant, but we have a variable background level where the lighter colours have a lighter background and the darker colours have a darker background. You can see that when you have the same input stimulus in the dark, it looks brighter, it responds more, has a larger amplitude, and the filtering that's involved it takes a lot longer to return back afterwards. So it has a different, a different uh, corner frequency in the filtering that's going on that adapts based on the background level. 
And if you keep the constant contrast of the stimulus relative to the background level, you see the responses are even, but the corner frequency, again, is different because the corner frequency is not based on the stimulus, it's based on the history, and the response is based on the relative nature, so it's logarithmic, the relative nature of the stimulus to the background. So this is some of the very basics that we get from the very first neuron within the visual system of a fly in this case. People have done uh, some experiments on primates, not myself, so don't get upset with me, but people have done experiments on primates who have shown very, very similar sorts of responses. Um, the time scale is a little bit different. Flies are a bit faster because the tasks they need to do are a bit higher speed than the tasks that primates need to do, but the functions are essentially the same, which is really, really surprising given the evolutionary difference between the two and the fact they're using completely different chemical cascades to perform these functions. Parallel evolution using completely different chemicals, biochemicals involved, but the functions themselves are almost identical, which tells us something about just how important this processing actually is for operating in a dynamic environment. So here's a reconstruction of an actual image. This is not a model. We did not model this. This is direct recordings from the insect brain. In this case, the photoreceptor, so just the very first neuron. Played this movie one pixel at a time. You can see in the top right, we had a very bright single LED to a single pixel, a uh, single photoreceptor, and played that over time, and then went to the next one and played that over time, and went to the next one and played that over time, and then the fly died, so we got a new fly and started again. And this took a really, really long time. It might have been 50 hours of usable recordings, but that it, multiply that by five, six, seven, ten times in order to get these recordings. These are the average of three. You can see it's a little bit noisy on the right there because that is real neuronal noise. That, that isn't simulated noise. That it, um, that's what the recordings we actually got. How exactly we were able to adjust these systems and display them on the screen I can talk about later if you're really interested in them. But I think that's fascinating that it's the dynamics and the non-linearity that actually help be able to detect this target against the moving background. So there's the fly visual system. Um, got a brain uh, diagram on the left and we've just chopped it up and put it in half because you get the two hemispheres on the right there. Um, the different components, it looks slightly different because they have a compound eye, many, many facets of their eye, um, and each facet represents a single pixel. So although they've got many lenses, many thousands of lenses, that only means they've got many thousands of pixels within the image that they're able to resolve. It's very low resolution, but they're still able to do it. And the fact they're able to do it with low resolution helps because it means the tasks they do don't require high resolution. And they're the different layers within the brain. As, it go, as the information goes deeper into the brain, you get to higher order concepts and multiple different levels of processing. Um, I'm not going to go through everything about the fly visual system, but we've reverse engineered pretty much the whole thing from the optics right the way through um, the lighting normalization, redundancy reduction, optimization, and then up the top we have motion detection, motion normalization, and regional motion estimation, optic flow. And down the bottom we have um, pattern detectors and then the ability to detect small moving targets in clutter uh, down the bottom. And you don't need to have the whole system to get a task. If you want object identification, you can get it out of the first step. Edges or outlines can come out of uh, the middle step, uh, the LMC. Um, if you want optic flow, you can get it out of there. You want directional motion. You want to not just that there's movement, but there's movement that has a purpose that is going in a direction that's not over time changing so much. 
Um, you can get that out. You can get self motion of the camera or the scene or whatever as you're moving through um, in regions and break it out. Um, you get small target detection. You can also have crosstalk between them. Um, motion energy can help you remove clutter, and I can talk about that. And you can have what we like to call noise or motion noise, which is things like trees that are moving. They're always moving, but they're moving in the wind, and they're always at the same average location. So you want to suppress that because that's, that's noise that's not in important information, and you can use that for feedback. So we have pre-processing, we have motion processing, and we have target processing. And you can have some communication between them as well. And here's an example of what you might be able to see if you put some lighting normalisation and some motion detection overlaid. And you can see, if you look on the top right there, you can see a plane that's flying through the air that, um, that gives you its position and its velocity. So we, can, we have no uncertainty principle here. We know both position and velocity. Um, and you can see people walking along the bottom. They're also tag tagged with their velocity. Um, and it makes it much, much easier to see what's going on in one scene. Uh, some image capture that has been put together by Phil put all these things together. Why do we have so many cameras? Because we can, and we like to get everything we possibly can. Each one of these uh, achieved a different task, and making them all go together and all sync up was lots of fun, I'm sure. Phil would love to talk to you about it one day. Um, and this is the sort of thing we get. On the left is regular recordings, and on the right is our processed recordings. And we've got monochrome and colour to show you the difference there. And you can get a lot more information after the processing that we have. So things like what's about to happen here is this woman's about to run in front of this car. Now, if we don't, if we don't have this processing, they might get the, she might have got lost in the shadows. And if this was an autonomous system, might not see the person who's hiding in the shadows until it's too late. But we can do this processing and see what's going on, get a lot more detail about uh, that uh, woman who's on her phone at the, at the um, bus stop, and uh, just a lot more information in general. We can also do this in infrared, and you can see here that we've picked up a lot more information. You can tell that this recording was pre-2020 because there are actually people around, and you've got a large mass of people at the back of the road there that you can see much more clearly after processing on the right there. Um, also, we could, I just think it's really interesting. You can tell if the car is front wheel or rear wheel drive and how long it's been running by how hot it is. Um, that's just infrared. But it actually helps a lot more be able to get more information from the scene. And we can tie this to a neural network, uh, even an existing neural network, and can improve classification rates by improving normalisation of the lighting. So you get more information in the dark, you don't lose information in the light, and it makes it more even, evenly lit, which means you don't need... The objects aren't as complex because you've removed the a reliance on lighting condition, and so you can get better classification rates. Uh, so we've done that, we've looked at classification rates, um, and they're improved. Even when the system is not trained on these processed images, they're existing networks, the one thing that we don't, um, we don't improve in this case is when classification is based on colour. When classification is based on texture, we get an improvement. When classification is based on colour, so for example we have oranges and potted plants in this case, after we do the processing, the orange looks too orange. We have enhanced the orangeness of the orange and so the neural network who's only been trained on dull oranges says, I don't know what this is or the potted plant looks too green, it's not dull and muted, therefore it can't, be a, it can't be a plant, because I've never seen a plant that looks like that before. So that's something that we will work on, but uh, to, a, to a person they look vastly improved as well. Um, how are we going for time? Okay, so optic flow, the motion 
that you see when you move. So who's looked out the window of, say, a car or a train in this case and noticed that objects that are closer move faster than objects that are further away? Yep. So you can actually get relative motion cues by how much, uh, um, by looking out at how things appear to be moving. The flow of information across the retina will tell you about distance. Also, if you're, say, ro rotating, so um, you can, the motion energy changes depending on how you're moving through the environment and you can extract that information out in order to get your movement through the environment, the ego motion. So if I'm travelling straight, things appear to be moving from the point of expansion where I'm heading out around. They get the largest when they're at 90, de 90 degrees on either side and then they go back down again on, as they go behind me and the point of contraction, which is exactly opposite the way I'm travelling. So when you have rotation, everything has the same apparent um, has the same apparent velocity if you're, say, yawing and I'm looking over here, everything uh, uh, appears to be moving the same across the scene, but if I'm rolling, again, I have a, a point of, that I'm uh, the axis and I'm moving around the axis in front of me, I get this roll sort of motion. So you can actually look for the velocity and the relative amplitudes of this optic flow and extract information cues about how you're moving through the environment. And there are many different types of motion detector. There are differential, which rely on calculating the change in space and change in time, or that's velocity. Um, Region-based matching, so you, you've got this object is here in this frame and, this object, and the, this object is here in this frame. They look like the same object and they've moved this much, therefore that's how much movement we've got. Um, you know, Phase-based, which are like differential but in the phase domain instead of the luminance domain. And we've got energy-based, where it's more like correlation and you look for the flow of, op of information. Differential, region-based and phase-based are actually preferred by engineers and computer scientists. They're much easier to use. Um, but all biology uses energy-based, which is kind of a bit of a difference. Why does biology use energy-based when that's not the preferred for most engineers and computer scientists, but every animal that has ever been tested uses the same energy-based system? It's called an elementary motion detector or an EMD. Um, and what I did is compare it against a gradient model, which is a spatial temporal derivative, which is the easiest to use, easiest to think about. Um, the, the pros of the EMD is that it has good noise performance because you weight things that are a higher contrast more highly, things that are lower contrast more likely to be noise and more difficult to get motion cues from, you weight less likely and so you, you're more robust against noise. But the cons to that is when you have high contrast, um, you multiply two large numbers together you get an even larger number and so if you have high contrast and you multiply that you get an, a large response and if you have low contrast and you multiply that you get a low response and so it confuses contrast and velocity. Now when you're looking for optic flow, it's the equivalent of looking for, say, kinetic energy. In a mechanical system you have kinetic energy, half mv squared, ignore the half, it's just a multiplier, so you've got mass, velocity squared. You're looking for velocity, that's great. In the, uh, but you, you've got a mass component in there. In the visual domain, it's contrast velocity squared. So contrast in the visual domain is the same as mass in the mechanical domain and velocity squared. So we need to remove our dependence on contrast in order to find the velocity information. The gradient model doesn't have that because you can see the change in intensity cancels out. So you get change in intensity divided by change in time, so the derivative of intensity with time, and you get change in intensity over space, change 
and there. And then when you divide them, the change in intensities cancel out and you get um, the change in space over change in time, which is velocity. You calculate it directly. The problem with that is you've got a derivative and a division. And if you've got a noisy signal and you find the derivative of a noisy signal, it's more noisy, and then you divide by a noisy signal, it gets even more noisier-ish. So we have a problem. Now, this is how the EMD works. Is we have an object that moves through a re uh, receptor, it has some sort of delay as the object moves to the next receptor, um, a next detector there. Um, it can come out and correlate together if the delay is just right. If you spread your delay and you have like a low pass filter response, you can actually estimate how slow, uh, how slow or how fast the object is going by how large the response is. Um, the problem is if you move too fast, then you move too fast to the delay, then you're not going to correlate or you're going to get a reduction, which means there's a peak velocity that you can detect and after that it goes down again, but as long as we leave that pretty high, we work on the left hand side of the velocity curve there, we're okay. The problem is that if that object is lower contrast, so we have a lower signal, we have two low signals together, they correlate together, they get a smaller response, and so you get the res uh, response that's dependent on contrast instead. So that's the paradox. We know that animals use EMDs, they've been tested back in the 50s, it was proven that beetles have them, and then all the animals so far have been tested have shown the same. But biological recordings from flies in this case, on the motion detection parts of the brain, actually are, re are quite consistent across different scenes, when the basic model is highly variable. So what is the problem? The problem is that the basic model has been linearised on the front and back end. We've assumed that photoreceptors can essentially be, can be approximated by linear systems. The um, second level neurons, the LMCs, can be approximated by linear systems. The nonlinearities that exist will just ignore them and we don't worry about the adaptation because that's dynamics and they're hard, so we'll just linearise everything and you end up getting a no result. And that happened a lot in the 80s and 90s. People tried this, couldn't get it to work, left it alone. It wasn't going to work. But then I looked at this and said, we have oversimplified it. The dynamics and the non-linearities are important. They are useful. And that's what I did. I put them together one at a time and from the, the graphs down the bottom on the top left there, you see the EMD only response, then you add the photoreceptor processing that does this normalisation, and the, and the responses tighten up. And then you add in the LMCs, or the spatial processing, it doesn't really do much, it it, because it's high pass filtering, it re removes the low, low rotations a bit, but it didn't really improve very much. But then I added the next stage, it improved it a little bit. And then I added a stage four, it improved it a little bit more. And then I added stage five of the end bit and it worked. It worked really well, really accurately across all of these scenes, really repeatable. And so I went back and said, stage two didn't do very much. What happens if I take that out? I'll make sure I balance the output of one so it can go into three without two in the middle but what happens if I take two out and the whole thing crashed? It didn't work anymore. Because this system is the, the sum of the parts, the holistic approach is better than the individual components. If you don't have one of these components, the whole thing doesn't work. So it's the combination of these dynamic nonlinearities that actually provide the function that you're after. And simplifying it, and ignoring parts of it or linearising parts of it, just make it not work. Also, we tested with noise, and you can see in your eyes, even at the massive amounts of noise, your eyes can sort of pick this stuff out, at least at the high speed. And 
uh, graphed this against the gradient model and showed that the gradient model under perfect idealised conditions with zero noise beat the EMD in terms of ability to, to uh, independently detect motion across different scenes. But as soon as you get any sort of realistic level of noise that you'd find in the real world, the EMD did better than the gradient model. In fact, it Im slightly improved its response at noise levels that you see within natural systems. I can talk about the reason for that, why you get an increase in performance in the presence of noise in certain circumstances. Um, this is a slide I've got for Phil's stuff, which was going to be after mine, but because mine was, talk was going to take too long, we're skipping Phil till later. This is all I'm going to say, that he has improved on that model and made it work in real time, and you'll hear more in the future from him. So, after optic flow, we have target detection. So here in, we have infrared target detection. We have two boats in the background and a nice sea moving around. Does anybody else see any objects that we're looking for? Any important objects in this scene besides the two hot boats in the background? Nope. Yep, yeah, Phil does because he knows what to look for. Nobody else? Nobody want to hazard a guess? Nothing else in that scene? Well, you would have got eaten. There was a shark. There's a shark right there. If we go back, you can have a look at the shark fin as it moves across the scene. Now I've shown you where it is. Um, there we go. I don't know if you can see it. Um, there it is. And the detective was able to find it. And when we put a tracker on it, we 100% didn't miss it at all. No problem in detecting that. Um, also use it to detect koalas in bush. So we have uh, fly drones over top of trees and detect koalas. And you can have a look at the state-of-the-art enhancement methods that I've got there. I've, got, I've given three different examples for the two images. And they have plenty of false detections and quite often miss the koala targets. But our processing, you can see on the right there, basically just the, just the koalas, nothing else. Um, look for drones. A lot of target detections are really good at detecting big, hot targets, like jet planes, even at very far away. But that's fairly easy and basic. They're very obvious. So why, what we decided to do is look for drones. In this case, we're looking for the heat signature of a two-metre wide drone. A two-metre wide drone, that's okay. Foam. It's a two metres wide of foam. Very thin profile. And it has a single DC propeller in its back, surrounded by the foam. And I wanted to know whether we could detect the heat signature of that single DC motor at range, encased in foam, in the sky. And we could. We could do this. We could um, d extract out some information from the, from the scene. Uh, oh well. And we can get some, the photoreceptor and then the LMC, stage one, stage two, and then target detection uh, stages. And it pops out really easily. It's at 500 metres. Um, we're able to detect it quite easily. Have I... Yep, I think the battery's gone down. Don't know. Okay, um, very, very briefly, I don't know if everybody knows what a receiving operating characteristic curve is, rock curve. What it is, is it measures false detections on the x-axis and true detections on the y-axis. So what you actually want is a system that is up and to the left. It means you've got a large number of true detections, a very low number of false detections. And that's what we got when we were looking at our target detection system up and to the left at five to seven hundred metres, even at eight to nine hundred metres. The blue line, the blue dash line is our processing and the other lines are comparison metrics for other systems. And you can see that the, that black line is almost approaching the blue one there. That black line is also us. 
um, that's just using the first two stages, whereas the, the dark blue one is using all the processing stages. And still, they look reasonably close until you notice that the x-axis is log. We're talking factors of 10, 100 times better than any other system that exists. Uh, looking for very, very small targets visible, not just infrared. So there's some images, and there's the images with our targets in them. Can you see all the targets? They're the targets we're looking for. So go back again. That's our images. That's our targets. You see our targets? I haven't even moved the images. I, I do this with moving images as well, because still images are boring. That's where the targets are. We populated targets all over the place, gave it chicken pox so that we could sit, get lots of samples, made sure that it wouldn't interfere with the spatial processing, did all those calculations, moved it around, and this is the processing we got. In this case, it's very, very difficult. The LCM, local contract metric, is state-of-the-art me method that we are comparing to, and you can see that that processing is thousands of times worse than what we're able to achieve. So we have drone detection in the sky, or against trees in this case, and heat difference, so infrared is good when it's in the sky, but really bad when it's against the trees, because you can't see it. And visual differences change a lot. So what processing method should we use? Why not both? Well, let's do both. And meanwhile, that video that I've got there is not a still image, that is a video, and there is a drone moving in that scene. Can you detect that drone? No. Nope. We can. There's our, there's our responses. Again, a log scale on there. We, um, this isn't with a tracker. This is just a detector. We put a tracker on there. We can remove random false positives. But we have 100,000 times better than the other methods that we're comparing to. Also, it's not just a vision system. It's a signal processing system that we have. So light, sound, very different, but there are similarities between eyes and ears in the processing signal itself. So we can have raw audio, we can split it into frequency bands, and then cut them into time segments, and that gives us spectrograms. And spectrograms are just two dimensions with a signal, just like an image. So we can process these things just like we do with images. And what I've done for drone detection in microphones is greatly expend the range that we can detect drones from acoustic signals. So you've got the, the, the normal without processing in, in there in the light blue and the green much further distance that we can detect just by doing some pre-processing. All the rest is exactly the same. Um, looking at Hydrophones, it doesn't just have to be air, and we're doing some processing on this, uh, more to come, and we can extract out the information, increase the contrast, and, be, and the hypothesis is we'll be able to detect these things further out more accurately. Got a hardware implementation working with a company called Cuvos, um, who have started doing this. They, they have Uh, the photoreceptor model, basic photoreceptor model, working at 100 frames per second. So that's reasonably, close, reasonably fast. Won't get a lot of blur and motion from that. Full HD at 100 frames a second as well, not just one or two pixels. And you can get lots more information, like we can see the face of this person as they drive past through the sun glare that you can't from a regular view. So what bio-inspired signal processing can do, can stop information loss due to saturation, enhance contrast of salient features, assist in environmentally environment, invariant encoding of information, facilitate passive detection and tracking of small targets and clutter. Um, but it does work best and only if you actually have the information to start with. We don't invent information. That, it's not a thing. Once you capture information, if you've saturated, if you have quantized it, it's gone. We have to be at the sensor level or have a lot more information that we can extract. But it enhances changes and variability in a way that greatly assists in the classification and detection of objects. 
Um, it's all about non-linear adaptation. It's all about being able to adapt to the environment and the stimuli that are there. Um, lots of acknowledgements there. Um, lots of people from uh, Uni Adelaide, Uni South Australia, Flinders. Phil's on there twice because Phil's followed me around. So <laughs> he was at UniSA with me and, and then at Flinders uh, now. Um, plus, I guess I get to thank him twice. <laughs> that means... <laughs> Okay, um, that's about it, I think. Yep. Sorry, I